Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with ex Sale Sharks, Leeds Carnegie, an England rugby union player and current strength and conditioning coach at Wasps, Andy Titrell. Okay, welcome to episode four of the Pacing Performance Podcast. Today I've gone down a little bit of a different route. Um, I've got Andy Titrell on the phone. Um, we've gone down this route because I thought it might be a really good uh, crossover between coach and player. Andy's been um, obviously a big name in rugby union, uh, men with sail sharks, and uh, England and the British and Irish Lions. But also crossed over into into S and C at various different clubs. Um, came across Andy on my master's course when I was been really busy looking through who else is on the course. Came across Andy's name, link, uh, looked up his his name on LinkedIn. Saw his his various clubs and what he'd done in strength and condition already as a player, and thought it'd be it'd be great to get him on the phone and and look at his from his perspective as a player and a coach. So welcome, Andy. Hi Rob. Hi mate. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know who you are, could you give us a bit of a background on your bit playing career and how you've kind of jumped into, well into and out of in strength and conditioning? Yeah sure. Um, I mean I uh, I started playing, I signed my first you know, professional contract um, you know, in 2001 um, when, uh, when I joined Sale Sharks and um, I, I came, you know, straight out of school. Um, I took a gap year. Um, the game had been professional for about four or five years since then, so I knew I knew what I wanted to do at that point. So, um, so yeah, I went I went from sale. I had, you know, um, about seven great years there. Won a couple of, uh, you know, Parker Penn you know, medals there in Europe and the championship. Um, and then uh, I gained my England caps and. and Represented the British and Irish Lions there, and um, I then made made my journey down uh, to the southwest to Gloucester. Um, I had a couple of years there, and then ventured myself back up north to to Lees Carnegie, uh, where I ended up cap- captaining the side as well. Um, and I had a great time at, at Leeds. Um, the, the 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 squad and the, the management were fantastic. Um, at that point, I was still playing and involved in the England setup as well, so so that was fantastic. Um, and then over the last couple of years, I um, I decided to to give the the Rabo League a you know a chance, and I had the opportunity to go up uh, up to the capital in, in Scotland. So I played up in Edinburgh just for a season. And um, last year, I decided to come back into uh, into the Championship, um, mainly to do my my masters as well. Um, and uh, and I signed for London Welsh, and uh, unfortunately. Um, late last year, I, I sustained a, you know, a, a serious injury and um, it ended up being a career-ending injury. So um, I had to retire. Had to retire in January of, of this year. Um, so it's uh, it's still pretty raw. Um, obviously, not having the, you know, the what, what I call the luxury of, of, of playing and competing um, at that professional level now. So it's. Um, I'm obviously still trying to come to terms with it, but also sink my teeth into into other aspects of the sport as well. So you've done you've done bits with uh, Leeds County when you were a player there with regards to the academy. Uh, you've done bits with uh, University of Liverpool. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So how did you how did you juggle the um, the playing and the the S and C, and how did you think that you know why do you think that when you're playing S and C might be the way to go? Uh, with regards to when you when your career ended, but it was when I was um, I was actually down in um, down in Gloucester actually. Um, I, I've been involved with as as a player. I've been involved with some world class uh, conditioners. Um, you know, from, from Mark Bickham to Jason Davison, uh, Calvin Morris, you know, Mike Anthony. You know, the, the list is endless in in my opinion and. Um, it was when I was at Gloucester that um, 
something something just happened. You know, I, I was very competitive at that point anyway. I'd, I'd come off the back of the Lions tour and um, you know winning the Premiership with Sale, and so so my drive as a player was there, but. I knew that there was something more that um, I needed to find, and um, and conditioning became it. Um, I I gave myself the opportunity to to, to understand the you know the, the actual ins and outs of, of what made a, a player more complete than just turning up and training. So I, I took a an understanding um, to what was going on, why I was doing certain things. I posed questions to our Head of you know head of conditioning you know all the all the time and um, I started to improve I, I saw changes physically in in the gym um, which then had knock on effects you know into uh, into the sport itself so that that kind of like gave me the the uh, I say the, the the thought that you know I'd like to you know explore this more as I got older and as I got more more experience under my belt so when opportunities came along to you know condition you know the Liverpool Scholars um, and Liverpool Rugby team. Um, you, you know it was a, it was a great stepping stone for me um, to put into place, I guess. You know my philosophies and and, and the crossover between kind of like my work ethic as a, as a player, but also that as a coach. And um, but by far the the opportunity that I had to condition and head up the, the strength and condition at Leeds Carnegie um, in the academy was. Um, was such an exciting one, so I basically looked after the all, all the, the the players from under I think under 14s up to under 19s. So that's the junior to the senior academy, and I actually had hands-on work with the you know with the 10 or 12 players in the senior academy. So it, it was challenging for me to to organise my schedule as a as a player, um, but also as a coach. And also to look after these boys that were all at different universities, different colleges, um, and to get them all in to obviously um, follow a program that I believe would, you know, would, would set them up and give them every every chance to, to play first team, and uh, whether that be, um, you know, with Leeds or or at another club. So how did you? Um, was it an easy transition going from doing what you were doing as a player and being told what to do in in the gym and having little bits of input, asking questions why, and then you actually creating your own program for these young lads? What was that transition like? I, I found I found that transition pretty easy. Okay. If I'm honest. Um, as I say, I, I had a lot of uh, a lot of support around me. Um, yeah. One of my mentors was uh, was Jason Davison. Um, who was uh, head of performance at Leeds Rhinos as well as Leeds Carnegie. Okay. Um, you know, so I had a, a huge amount of you know guidance there if and when I needed it. I also had um, the head conditioner at Leeds Carnegie um, called John Noonan. Um, I think he's working with uh, GB skiers uh, currently, but he was uh, he he was brilliant. Um, you know, any um again any questions that, that i had or anything i was unsure of he knew some of those players as well that i was uh, that i was looking after uh, from his time in the academy so um i was kind of like given uh, i was given a free free reign on it um you know i i'd, I'd put plans together I'd, I'd then go and double check them with the with the head of performance to, to make sure that he was happy with the way that I was uh, and where I was taking the players, mm. um, and, and he had no problems at all. So he, he kind of like let me let me get on with it, and I had, we had that mutual respect for one another. Um, that if anything, if I had a question and I was unsure of something, that his door was always open, and I think that's that's vitally important when you when you have a mentor. Mm. Um, not just someone as well from a from a work capacity, but but someone who's who can be a mate as well. Um, but also he can drive your standards. Um, so my standards as a player was was always a hundred percent, you know, in, in my eyes. And um, I wanted to make that crossover. I wanted to be the best S and C coach that that I could possibly be, and and give every uh, every player that I'd come into contact with that that opportunity to. To, to be the best player that they could as well, and, and I, I certainly saw that strength and conditioning gave me that tool and was that vehicle for me, and um, I very much saw it as, a, as their opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So just just moving on a little bit, looking at your 
you, you playing career when you started in 2000 and was it 2001? You signed 2001, pro? yeah. So what what has changed in the in the practice that in in SNC what what people were prescribing to you back in 2001 to last year 2013 before you before you stopped playing? Well, yeah, um, a, a fair bit's changed. Um, I, I remember when I first started playing, we had one conditioner right. to, to the whole squad. And, and we're talking a squad of, you know, 35, 40. The, the squad weren't as big as what they were, you know, that they are now. Okay. You know, finance is a, is a reason for that as well. But the management team was small. So we had one, one physio, one conditioner, you know, a head coach and assistant coach. Um, and then obviously the board. So, you know, we were, we didn't have, a, as players, we, we didn't have, a lot of um, a lot of time spent without conditioner. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to you know, go around you know the players individually and you know, see how they were getting on. Watch them out of the corner of his eye if he was watching somebody else, and, and he didn't have eyes out there for him. You know, on the gym floor, as in you know assistant conditioners now, which they have, and um, interns as well that are given certain certain amount of responsibility. But um, I think that you know the, the biggest focus. Has been on on weights programs. I think what weight the weights has been the, the emphasis of players to get bigger um, and stronger and more powerful um, has increased year on year. And um, you know, alongside of that, I think there's more injury prevention um, as a whole being placed into programs now um, as a squad, but also on individual requirements. Um, but also players seek external advice. Yeah. Um, you know, they seek their own SNC coaches and they seek their own nutritionists as well. Um, so for me, that's something that I did. Um, I never, I saw, I've seen external SNC coaches now probably for the past eight, eight years. And it's only had, I believe, a, you know, a positive impact on, on my playing career and, and my mentality as well. Um, Never once has that, you know, conflicted with what we were doing as a squad. Um, as I say, you know, the, that my both both of my coaches knew me. They um, they saw me on a on a weekly basis. Um, you know, and obviously I saw my my SSC coach at the at the clubs on a daily basis. So you know, if I was in a in a in a power phase, I'd make sure that I you know go and see my coach, and and he understood what phase I was in and. And where I wanted to go, and, and he had actually come up with something a little bit different, but, but kept me on track. It, it was never, it was never the conflict with, with what was doing. And I think some some players are like that now. They, they look for that edge, they look for that extra investment, mm. uh, which I think is a huge part of the sport. If, if players can invest time and money into themselves, then it will give them longevity. Um, if they seek external S and C coaches, nutritionists, they'll get themselves into the best possible shape and condition that will then allow them to go out and perform um on the weekend which is predominantly what what we're paid for yeah. um you know so that you know that there, there are certain areas that that um that i've seen you know change over the last you know 14 years in in s and c uh players mindset um you know but to, but a bigger focus on on obviously the weights some 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 clubs have you know three to four weight sessions a week whereas before we were only on two mm. um and that there was no that there was it, it was a lot of work for one conditioner to do um i say in a squad of 40 to look after each individual um percentages of, of what they were to lift um different phases as you see now, you know, you, you can have a group of, you know, eight or nine on a strength phase while some are doing power, while some still need, you know, time uh, putting some mass on. So, you know, it helps having numbers on the floor as well. Um, you know, so it's um, it, it certainly improved up to a, to a great standard that I believe it's at at the moment. So I think it's become a lot more individual. I think that I think they have to. Yeah. I think. Um, you know, if you put a, a program together that's, you know, may, maybe four, three or four weeks long, mm. and so, and someone's shown, you know, someone's sped up and they've actually improved um, during certain phases or they've, they've had an injury that set them back, their program needs to be readjusted. 
Mm. And it may be that they then need to go into you know more of a power program, you know, or more of a, a rehabilitation type strengthening program. Um, and and with the numbers, you know, with the SSC coaches now, that you can afford. Well, I say you can you can afford to do that. Um, you know, I think it's a good idea that the way that certain clubs uh, that I know are run and, and how I would like to operate as well is is that I'd have a good idea about how every one of my players could, could lift um, and how and, and how they perform it in the gym and then I'd have um, you know my my other guys under me or, or with me you know helping certain groups you know um, going away so that so that when we come back and we discuss you know the the session that that day I'm up to speed with, with everybody. I know exactly what player A is doing to player, you know, to player S, player T. You know, no, nothing's left, nothing's left unturned. No players left uh, to, to just be getting on with it. I think there's a there's a responsibility as an S and C coach to to have that connection with your player, to know what makes them tick and, and what makes them work. So. Um, you know, if, if someone's finding it difficult in the gym and that they actually don't like lifting, and on a, to say, a standard program, maybe 45 minutes long, 50 minutes long, it's like, right, well, well, let's see what's what's a little bit different. What what can we do that we can drive your same, the same stim, stimulus, but, but get you in and out? And it's like, right, well, let, let's put things in circuit format. Let's, mm. let, let, let's give you things that, you know, you can get in and out of the gym, you can concentrate on, on other skills that, that you're wanting to do, whether that be a kicker and he's got a kick, hooker that's got to go and throw, from obviously from a rugby perspective, or if it's extra prehab or rehab that you need, let's filter it into the program so that you're not there, so that player's not there having to do you know 35 minutes prehab, then a 45 minute wait session, um, and then go out and, and do his um, and do his skills work as well, if, if that's an added requirement that that player needs. Um, because in the end, the, the, the play, that certain player will end up resenting um, what what he's got to do, and he, and you won't get the best out of him. So I think from a, I think that the management of uh, of the players from the SSC coaches is, is, is hugely important. Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned about <clears throat> you mentioned about um, calling upon certain guys to kind of run your ideas past uh, as you've been obviously developing as an SNC coach. Who were the? I mean. Now, but going back to when you started, who were the go-to guys apart from the guys that were currently around you, the head performance, the the, the head coach? Who were the guys then, and who are the guys now that are your go-to guys um, that you bounce ideas off? Yeah. Um, so as I say, you know, I, I listed some earlier. You know, some of the guys um, that, that that helped me along the way, and, and that I was uh, that I I trained under as a, as a player, but. Um, you know, right, right now, I, you know, I, I'd still obviously, J- Jason Davison's still, you know, a very good friend and, and mentor of mine and another guy called Ben Circle. Right. Um, he, uh, he, he's out, he's an Aussie guy and he's actually working with ACT at the moment. He's a, he's a fantastic guy. Um, I knew him at my time in, in Gloucester. Um, and he was another one that, uh, that mentored me, um, for, 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 a, for a long period as well. And, and as I said, still does. So I still keep in touch with him. Um, Darren Roberts as well. Um, uh, Darren used to work with. Uh, he used to be the high performance manager at Red Bull. I've known Darren for you know about 14, 15 years or so. So um, Darren's a friend first, um, and I guess um, you know sounding board second. Um, but then there's al- there's also a couple of guys. Um, you know a- Andy Mack. Um, um, Andy McKenzie, um, uh, Iron Disciple. So he's um, he's someone that I, that I throw ideas off of now, and I've got to know him and um, Chris Toombs as well um, over the last you know kind of like 15, 18 months as well. Um, and I think the reason why I've connected with them is I again I've got to know them through through Darren, but it's um, but they're very like-minded people. Um, they, they, they've been involved in rugby um, for, for a long, long time. Um, we share the same ideas, um, you know, so, so they can certainly help me if I come across any issues or any problems that I might find myself against. Um, 
you know, so they're, they're great guys to, to have on board. Okay, at my, at my fingertips with a, you know, just a just a phone call away. So it's uh, it, it's brilliant um, to have that that kind of caliber of, um, of coaches at my disposal. Mm. Totally agree. Um, so as a as an aspiring SNC coach, when you're still playing, you're asking questions to the the head conditioner. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Through the years, don't want to totally stitch you up, but is there certain things you've come across that you'd you've been asked to do something or something's in a certain a program, and you're thinking if that was if it was me, this won't be what I do, or if this was me, this won't be the way I'd go about getting um, to this getting to this goal. Uh, yeah, um, you'd have to name the person. Yeah, if I'm honest, yeah, I um. It only happened at, at, at one club and um, under one one coach, yeah. uh, one head conditioner. I, I just couldn't. <clears throat> and, and in all honesty, I hold my hands up. I, I should have gone and I should have spoken to him about it, um, for him to explain it to me in a little bit more detail. Um, I was resistant to it. I, I couldn't see the, the benefit and the impact it, it was having on me. Mm. Um, I knew kind of like what, what worked for me. Um, I didn't have um, kind of like a, any input, um, and I think as with experienced players, I think um, I believe they have to have some kind of input into their program. Um, that be, I'd say at the end of the day that they're going to be doing certain things that um, they're going to be doing things for you that um, you know they they may necessarily not not, not want to, and I, I do believe you have to you have to get them on side, and I think everybody's different. Um, going from a younger player to, to an older player, um, but um, I was uh, I I think I should have been more mature about it, and I should have um, you know, say, approached him. But I just could not see where his program was going, mm-hmm. the duration that it was uh, that it was for. Um, we had guys, certain guys were actually falling off the program and actually getting getting weaker mm-hmm. through fatigue, and I was like, well. This this shouldn't be the should this shouldn't be the case. I, I admit I was I was still young and I'm still learning my trader as a coach as well. That's why I think you know I was I was in the wrong and I should have um, I should have gone and gone and asked, but but I didn't. And um, I think at that point as well, I'd already been seeing you know a conditioner of mine outside for for for, for a good part of a year, um, and um, he'd got me in some fantastic shape. Um, so it was, um, you know, a really good, um, a good insight into into that relationship that you should have with, with an SNC coach and um, and the player itself. Mm. No, that's really good. So just from a um, not delving into what that specific situation was, but just from a kind of overall perspective, uh, is there something that you feel it's kind of commonly overlooked by SNC coaches that as a player? You think this needs to be in at a certain time of the year or all the time? That's often neglected. Um, I, I think. I think the biggest thing, again, in my opinion, I think the biggest thing that's neglected in, in a program is, is flexibility and mobility. Okay. Um, you, you know, I think a lot. A lot of coaches nowadays are very, very clued up when it comes to, to strength, when it comes to power. Um, if it's about making things um, specific in the program, yes, you have your, your general exercises, but there will be, you know, there is need for specificity uh, within within certain exercises. But again, from my experience, I found that a lot of the mobility and flexibility work is left to the physios to deliver, yeah. um, rather than the SNC coach. And um, for for myself, I, I like to see how my players can move, what they can and can't do, what they find challenging what they find difficult um, and I can then put push that into the program I can then push it into parts of the warm-up as well um, and for the players it's challenging it's challenging for their mindset especially if they find it difficult um, uh, and it's a specific part of the program that they're not ha- having to, to lift you know heavy heavy amounts of weight whether they're having to squat under you know 106 170 kilos you know but do they have the flexibility do they have the mobility in the in the hips and the ankle um if they don't then that's an issue so that has to be addressed before the guys can get under the bar um 
but I also believe that it, you've got to make it enjoyable um, and uh, and structure certain parts um, that then allow them to happen subconsciously as well, where they then just start to move and they actually um, that they're not so rigid in in their movement patterns. And I think a lot of that gets pushed onto onto the physios. Um, but I like to do it as part of um, part of warm ups. Um, you know, and as part of things that are specific to, to then what we're going to be training or what we're going to be doing out, out in the field, um, you know, as a result of that. And, um, don't get me wrong, I think some, some guys do do it, some SNC coaches do do it as part of their program, but others kind of might give it a, you know, five minute look over and then, right, let, let's get lifting kind of thing. And it's only just brushed the surface. Yeah. Um, so for, for, for me as a player as well, I, I did a lot of that. I did a lot of mobility work, and it, it then just had a huge knock-on effect with with what I was like when I was under the bar, and my actual understanding of, of my body movements and what I could and couldn't do, and, and where I struggled, and the flexibility that I had in, in certain areas. And um, it's something that that I neglected for the, maybe the first five or six years of my career, but but definitely not in the in the latter stages, especially in the last you know eight eight years. So. Um, that that's something that I believe is commonly overlooked um, by by coaches as well. Mm. I mean, like you mentioned about the um, putting the warm up. I know I see loads of things um, about warm ups, and it still involves a a five minute jog around the pitch, um, just basically wasting time. But you, did those those little aspects, like your flexibility, like your mobility, can be put into into warm ups, like you say, and it's kind of not disguised. But it's it's not got loads of plates bashed on a bar, yeah. um, so it's probably not as appealing to certainly rugby lads. But it can be stuck into the warm up, um, which you do anyway, and just make yeah. that a bit more specific. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that's that's exactly it. You know, that's I think when when it comes down, if it comes down to a gym warm up, I'll, you know, I, I don't. I sometimes I don't understand why coaches do lengths of the gym or. Mm. Um, you know, high knees, etc. To to do, uh, you know, a pulse raiser yeah. prior to going in lifting. Um, I I would I'd get them to to do mobility work. I'd then get them on an empty bar and I'd, I'd go through some complexes with them. I'd get yeah. them to lift specifically to what they're then about to go and do. Mm. Um, you know, by by doing, you know, laps of the field or laps of you know the the, the gym and then going in to do to do leg weights. <laughs> You've not act for me. You've not actually um, gone through the specifics of, of, of body parts and, and body movements that, that you're then going to find yourself having to lift mm. in the actual core of the program. Mm. And, and the same would be be an upper body as well. Um, you, you know, I'd, I'd I'd get them to do something you know, that, that mimics you know what they're what they're going to be doing in the work. The same as in in a field program as well. So I'd put the I'd put the mobility in there as well. I, for me, from a rugby perspective, as an SNC coach, I also see myself as a skills coach as well. So I'll get the I'll get the the guys handling the ball and and prepping them so that they so that the coaches haven't got that to worry about, so that they can then go straight into their you know, part of the rugby session, and they're switched on mentally and physically as well. Mm-hmm. So it's about it's not just about you know um, you know running through poles and, and stepping left and stepping right it's about putting a ball in there as well getting them to think while whilst they're whilst they're moving and then break say break them up get them down doing some mobility work put some fun and then some, some enjoyment in there make make something a competition as you can and you know we, we play professional sport because it's it, it gives us that competitive edge um, and at the end of the day, as, a, as an athlete, as a professional athlete, you, you want to win things. And, and even if it's as simple as you, you wanting to, to win a, a bear pool race, <laughs> then, uh, you know, you want to be number one. Uh, well, I always did anyway. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> it goes the same as if, you, you're in the, if, you, if you're in the gym. You want to be the biggest bencher. You want to be the biggest squatter. Uh, you want to have the highest counter jump movement. Um, you know that that's why things are there. So um, you know, make it competitive, make it fun, make it relevant. Mm. You know, I think as soon as you, especially with the ball, and talking about football again, as soon as you put a ball in there, 
instantly you get that buy-in from the players that you're not just going to do a lap of the field. There is some ball work. They can see the ball, so instantly they want to get involved. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming that's the same in rugby. As soon as you get yeah. that ball passed about, um, the smiles on the faces, it's not, oh, not blew this lap again. You know, it gets that, it gets that buy-in straight away. But that, that's exactly how, how I would approach, you know, um, you know, war, warming my guys up. You, you know, they, geez, you, you could tell anyone, and I, I mean this in the nicest way, you could tell anyone to run to that cone and come back again, forward and backwards or on the side, but put a ball in the hand and again to communicate with guys in and around them or, or, or just make structured chaos to, to certain drills. It actually gets the player to think what they're going to be doing with the ball. Um, because that's what happens in a game. It, it's it's chaotic. It's um, it's unstructured a lot of the time. Mm. You know, with turnovers and you know um, uh, line breaks, etc. So I always try and put as, as much as I can into into a warm up that that will give them every opportunity to go and express themselves out in training, mm. uh, which will then obviously give them the, 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 the best way forward to, to when they're going out to play as well. Definitely. So just, just move on a little bit. You've seen, um, you've, you've done a little bit of um, like self-employed coaching. Uh, yeah. I've seen your website. I don't know if it's still ongoing or, or what, but how, you know, how did that come about and who were you working with? Now did you kind of juggle that between your playing and your, your S&C at your club and doing that as well? Yeah, I'm, I, I, um, in, in all honesty, I, I, I struggled with it. Okay. Um, basically, it came about because obviously I was getting into, I, I'd been a, you know, a, a couple of years, um, you know, qualified, and um, I, I was getting guys asking me, you know, to do some extra work with them and, and everything. So I kind of like took it upon myself to, to set up, a, you know, a little, a little business. Um, mm. I trained out of the clubs that I was at to begin with until I kind of like accumulated some of my own kit and a, and a bit of a premises as well. Mm. Um, you know, and basically I, I trained, I was that guy that professional players come to see, um, as well as their S and C coach. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I looked after guys that, um, I, I trained with, I played with, um, and they, um, you know, we, we do extra stuff, you know, pre in pre-season or before pre-season or, you know, during the season. So again, it was, and because I understood what phases they were going through and, and rugby uh, as the game in general. Um, it, again, it was nothing to conflict with, with the conditioners that, that they were looking after. Um, so sometimes players need that 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 different environment, um, that different setting, um, a, a different voice as well. Um, and so that's kind of like how that came about. And then I started just to see kind of like some, some, some regular clients as well. Um, that, that, I guess wanted wanted to be trained like a like an athlete, um, you, you know. And I'll always, whenever I see people, I, I, that's how I'll always train them. I, I approach if I have a next door neighbour come to me and you know wants to train, I wouldn't train him any differently than if I train, you know, a professional rugby player um, in in the Premiership or in the Championship. Yes, the the the, the weights may be different, but the mentality that that I'll try and install into him, the mindset. Uh, when it comes to lifting the rest periods, they all stay the same. Mm. You know that that doesn't change. And um, you know I'm not one to. I like to get work done. I don't like to you know just stand around and, and chat even with, if it's with guys that I know because it's you know it's, it's their time. Mm. Um, you, you know and, and they want to get results out of it. Whether it, they want to get stronger, they want to get faster, they want to get more powerful. Um, that's kind of like what I've done. But I guess. What what I was very aware of is that when I had the business, um, unfortunately I don't have it anymore. But um, w when I did have it, um, I didn't want it to get in the way of, of me and what I did. Uh, and and first and foremost, that was playing. I didn't want to get in the way of way of my playing. So if I had a day off, I would I would still do what I did. Um, to prep myself for the game. So if it meant that I had to, or I wanted to go and do an extra session at the gym, I'd go and do that extra session. Mm. If I needed physio, if I needed a massage, or if I wanted a massage, I'd go and do it. If I needed to get some analysis done, line outs, or certain players at the base of the scrum, certain scrum moves, I'd go and do it. 
Whereas other players who had um, other interests outside may spend that day in work. Mm. Um, you know, gain, yes, gaining you know, valuable, valuable experience. But those that had their own business may say, well, look, you know, I can spend the whole day here and I could potentially earn 200 quid. Yeah. And I was like, that's not me. You know, you're playing, as I know now, your playing career is very, very short as a professional player. And, and if I could play on till I'm 50, I would do. But physically, you know, it's unheard of. Um, and the only way I would have carried on playing or would have stopped playing is that if the club didn't offer me a contract. Mm. Um, you know, so unfortunately, because I've had to retire through injury, that, that's, a, that's a big blow. But I don't regret one day that's gone by that I've had um, holidays that I've had off or say when the season's finished and I've had four or five weeks off, I carried on training. I did I did my stuff. I, I put my own plan and my own program together so that when I hit pre-season, I was in great nick. It didn't then take me three or four weeks to get into the nick that I expected to be in. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and that, that has been my mentality as a, you know, right, right from the word go, really. And um, so, yes... I still see the odd, odd client every now and again. Um, as I say, I don't have my, I still have my gym kit, but I don't have my facility to run it out of and I don't have my business anymore um, because I put um, everything in, into my rugby. <coughs> it may be something that I look to, look to start up again um, whilst I'm in this transition from you know, retiring into, um, into coaching. Um, but, but it's something that um, is definitely put food for thought now. So what, was that in Manchester or was that down south? So that, that was in Manchester. I had, okay. had a facility in South Manchester. Right. Um, as you say, uh, when, when Leeds Carnegie, Leeds Rhinos, Leeds Carnegie, uh, we kitted out their gym, obviously having a very good relationship with Jason. I, um, I bought some of the, some of the old kit off of them. Mm. It was, as I say, it was in perfect working order. It was exactly what I was after, squat racks. Bar, um, yeah, barbell. I bought an extra couple of barbells, mm. uh, some bumper plates, some dumbbells. Um, you know, some, and then I, I went and I bought my, some of my own stuff as well, some sleds and prowlers and uh, med balls and TRXs. So kind of like over the years, I knew what I wanted to, to try and put a little, uh, I guess, performance centre together, mm. and I knew that what would, you know, what I'd be happy with um, training people out of. Um, and, and that was it. So um, if you've got a great imagination as a coach and, and you can make things work, you don't need all the all the mod cons and you, you know that there's a lot of guys that don't that don't do things like you know that way. Um, you know as, lo- as long as you get get the guys working and um, you get your desired effect out of them as well, and you can also explain things to them because a lot of the time you know if things weren't explained to me. Um, I'd then go and ask, and I'd say, well, why, why are we doing this program? Why are we doing these exercises? It wasn't to be awkward. Mm. It was to find out, how is this going to make me better? How yeah. is this going to transfer onto the field? How is this going to make me better, you know, from a, yeah, from a performance-wise, um, you know, whether, whether or not I needed to put on a little bit more mass, whether I needed to lose some, some body fat, I would say, look, is this program going to do it? Um, and, and I like to push that education onto, onto the guys that I train, whether they say, whether they be next door neighbours or whether they be, you know, athletes that have been involved in, in rugby or, or sport for, you know, five, five, 10, 15 years. I, I still see it as, as my duty to try and educate them as, as best I can. If they know it, they know it. They, they, should, they should have no excuses then not to, not to understand what, what you're trying to, what you're trying to do with them. Mm. Um, but it's about work, working with those guys to um, to get the best out of them. No, that's been really interesting from from what you've said with the transition. Um, but I can see the clock going up to forty minutes, so yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. But just before that, I know you've said you've you've reached out to certain people. If people who are listening want to reach out to you, how would how would they go about that? I know you're quite active on social media, but what are your Twitter and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I say I, lo- I love speaking to, to, to like-minded people and you know, sharing ideas. I don't think it's, um, no, I don't believe uh, an SNC coach can re- um, rewrite the script. I think everything's out there. It's, it's how, it's how you as a, 
as a coach, uh, to put that into practice. And um, you know, I don't hide any, anything that I that I do. Um, and uh, so, as I say, I'm, I'm very active on, on social media, on, on Twitter. I'm just at Andy Titterall. Um, um, and say, you know, if anyone wants to get me on via my email, it's just Andy Titterall at yahoo.co.uk. Um, and I'm on that 24-7. Um, my phone rarely goes off, um, you know, from, from an email perspective. So um, if anyone ever wants to get in touch with me about, about anything, um, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer answer questions, etc. Um, I find engaging engaging with uh, with others, you, you know, a very, very useful tool and, and it's something that I'm always open to. That's brilliant. So if anyone wants to... Um... This will obviously be via uh, on iTunes, uh, the Pacey Performance Podcast, but it'll also be going on the website, and you can get on iTunes uh, via that, which is PaceyPerformance.co.uk. Just to big up my Twitter account uh, a little bit, it's at Pacey Perform, so give us a follow, and there'll be there's a uh, podcast up there, obviously as well as this one, uh, which has been absolutely brilliant. So just thanks Andy again um, for your time. And I will be pestering you about our master's work. Um, so, yeah, thanks again. And I will, I'll speak to you soon. No problem. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thanks a lot, mate. Cheers. Cheers.